Good evening, everyone. My name is Daphna Rubinovich, and I'm thrilled to welcome you back to the Giller Book Club, the seventh in a series of 14. Please check our website for the complete list and to register every month. You won't, you really won't want to miss a single one. For the best viewing pleasure, please have your Zoom on a side-by-side -side view, and that will make it all the more alive for you. It is my profound pleasure tonight to introduce you to our interviewer, Lisa Moore. Lisa Moore is the author of four novels and three short story collections, and she's just finishing up a new novel as well. Her novel, February, was long listed for the 2010 Man Booker Award and won 2013's CBC Canada Reads. Her novel, Caught, was a finalist for the 2013 Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize, as well as the Scotiabank Giller Prize. It was also later adapted into a CBC television series. The novel Alligator and the short story collection were also finalists for the Scotiabank Giller Prize. Alligator won the 2006 20, Commonwealth Fiction Prize. Moore often sets her stories in Newfoundland where she was born and raised and now lives with her family. Tonight, Lisa will be interviewing Eva Crocker, author of the acclaimed novel, All I Ask long-listed for the 2020 Scotiabank Giller Prize. There will be lots of wonderful questions and reading, and if you'd like to join in the conversation, please feel free to submit a question using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you do submit a question, your name will be entered into a draw to win two free audible titles of your choosing. So join the conversation. I don't want to waste any more of your time, so without further ado, Please welcome Lisa and Eva. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lisa Moore. I want to say thank you uh, to Daphna for, uh, for that introduction. And thank you to Alana and um, everybody who is involved with the Giller Prize. I want to say a special thank you to Jack Rabinovich for um, for creating the Giller Prize. And uh, I know he's deeply missed by the whole of Canadian literature. I also wanna say thank you to Harold Price and Emma Truax who are working behind the scenes to bring us to you. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce Eva Crocker. Eva is the author of a collection of stories called Barreling Forward, which won the Alistair MacLeod Prize for short fiction um, and the Canadian Authors Association Emerging, Emerging Writers Award and was a finalist for the Dan A. Olgivvi Prize for LGBTQ Writers. And she is the author of All I Ask, the book we're going to be talking about tonight, um, which won the Bank of Montreal Winterset Award recently. And the novel has been shortlisted for the Relit Award. And of course, it was longlisted for the Giller Prize. She writes art criticism uh, for places like uh, visual art news, border crossings and Canadian art. And she has written for the Overcast, which is a Newfound was it a Newfoundland weekly cultural newspaper. Um, and she is at, at the present moment doing a PhD in creative writing and art history and critical theory at Concordia University. I'll just tell you a little bit about Eva's novel. Um, all I Ask captures a generation of 20-somethings living on the gig economy in downtown St. John's in the early 2000s. It's a novel full of tenderness, compassion, and humor. Uh, there's an arch wit at work in this novel and an eye for the exacting and sometimes skewering detail. There are poignant friendships between women, there are roommates, high heat bills, uh, there are fundraisers for the arts community, there are punk shows in a community center, there's a struggle to make meaningful art, um, political protests, and queer sex and romance. I think Eva is one of those brave new writers at work today creating a new kind of writing in Newfoundland. So welcome Eva. Thank you so much. Um, in case anybody 
doesn't know. Lisa's my mom, so I have to take everything she says with a grain of salt, but I very much appreciate that. Um, and I also wanted to say thank you to Daphna and Emma and Harold, and uh, very excited to be here. Okay, um, Eva, yes, I am your mother. <laughs> <laughs> I will admit it, but it is true that, um, you know, I've been rereading this novel in, in preparation for the interview, and of course I've read it before, but uh, over the last few days I've been really struck by how smooth the novel is. It really is as smooth as silk. The dialogue and, and descriptions are natural and transparently clear. It's like a fast running brook. Uh, the scenes are spare and the pacing is taut and, and the plot is all about character development. That's how I would describe it. That's what I love about it. Thank you um, so much for saying that. <laughs> it's true, it's how I feel. Uh, I want you to tell me who your influences are when you were writing this or, you know, the kind of books that you thought about when you were writing, whether it was about content or whether it was about style. And maybe there were books that, you know, are the exact opposite of your book, but still influenced you. Hmm. Well, um, I thought a lot about Zoe Whittle's book, The Best Kind of People, partly um, because of the subject matter, but also because of how she deals with plot. She's really skilled at, at developing a plot. And when I started working on this book, I found I was reading novels in a way I never had before, really being attuned to the plot, because before that I had been writing short stories um, and I was more, I think when I was reading, I was paying more attention to images and to the sentence level work. And of course that's important in a novel too, but writing a big long story like that was a new thing for me. Um, so I thought about that novel. And I also thought about a novel called uh, How Late It Was, How Late, um, which is this intense stream of consciousness uh, following this man who's been, um, beaten by the police and he's lost his sight and he gets out of jail and it follows him for several days just as he's trying to get to the unemployment office to get benefits and to deal with the kind of repercussions of being out of jail and it really forces you to live through those days with him and the difficulty of trying to navigate those systems and how intentionally uh you know useless they are <laughs> for the people who really need them um, so this, this book kind of deals with some of that as well on a, uh, in terms of the subject matter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you've also written a lot about visual art and I'm, I'm thinking here about a job you had and, you know, this book of yours is really about the gig economy. And for a while you had a book, you had a job at the overcast, which, uh, I know you were writing a ton of a ton of pieces for that, and sometimes they were, um, you know, uh, profiles of entrepreneurs. Sometimes they were in-depth art reviews or interviews about art. Sometimes they were about community organizers. And I'm just like, I know you were like, I think in a, a year or two, you wrote 200 pieces for that magazine. Is that is that can that be true? <laughs> I would usually do like five a week. And I, I think I worked there for about two years. So I'm wondering if, if doing that, if like really, uh, well, first of all, interviewing tons of people and really trying to find out about their lives and what motivated them, but also listening to the way they spoke and that kind of thing, if that, if that work plays into your fiction at all. Yeah, I loved having that job. It was so much fun. And I think it, influenced the novel a lot because in the novel I was trying to capture St. John's in a really particular moment um, in 2017 when there was all this political unrest around the the liberal budget and uh, Muskrat Falls um, as well as police violence um, and so while I had that job I was speaking to all these different people in the community and I was really getting a feeling for the pulse of St. John's, um, which was super exciting. And I spoke to like artists about their work, but also like uh, somebody who's like a dog whisperer, <laughs> trained dogs. Um, 
And every day it would just be talking to somebody different and trying to, you know, represent them in the way that they wanted to be represented. Um, yeah, it was great. I felt so lucky to, to get to do that. And I had a lot of freedom to think about what I wanted to write about as well in that job, which is such a luxury. Mm-hmm. And you also had a job working with the uh, St. John's Women's Film Festival. Um, did, do you think seeing all those films had any effect on your writing? Probably. I, I got to do a lot of interviews in that job as well um, with uh, women filmmakers working in Canada. Um, so I talked to them about their work and that was before the overcast. So I actually learned a lot about oh, interviewing in that job and um, talking to people about their artwork. That was also a great job that was very um, connected to the community and yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, So, you know, this novel is really about a a particular generation in Newfoundland, I think. Um, You know, I was talking to Michael Winter and he read your book and uh, he said, you know, there are scenes that happen in downtown bars that, you know, 10 or 15 years before we had written about, but it's a whole different scene. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but the, but I think this, this generation that you're writing about are really experiencing the repercussions of um, the collapse of the economy in Newfoundland. When I, when I was writing my earlier books, you know, we were in the middle of a a oil boom and there was all kinds of money around and and houses were suddenly tripling in uh, worth, value or price. But but now we're seeing heat bills tripling in price. And And I'm just interested in sort of in this book, I think there is a real ambivalence at, at the very best uh, concerning authority, but also a, a kind of distrust of authority from young people who are, you know, living in this gutted economy and and jumping from job to job like uh, like kids on, you know, skipping ice pans, jumping from ice pan to ice pan on the on the shore of the ocean. So. Well, just tell me about that. Tell me about your experience of the city and and what it felt like to be an artist and uh, running around to, you know, all these different events. And I'm thinking particularly about, uh, I guess, the the punk community that, because I know you were from a very young age going to these fantastic wild punk shows that no mother would ever allow their 14 year old to go to (laughs) if they were in the right mind. Yeah, well, I think what I partly what I was trying to capture is how that economic instability really filters down into people's interpersonal relationships and creates tensions like with institutions, but also between people in a really intimate way when you're living with that kind of economic instability, it creates stress. Um, And so that's in there. And I, I also wanted to mention that I was thinking a lot about Sarah Tilly's book, Skin Room, because she's writing St. John's, I think like five or 10 years before I am um, in a similar kind of world of going, you know, working lots of different jobs and going to shows. And so maybe somewhere in between the, the world that you and Michael are writing about and the one that I'm writing about, um, but a similar scene. Um, and the punk shows, yeah, were lots of fun, of course. I feel like really lucky to have gotten to attend all those shows, which were like a labor of love. People put a lot of work into putting them off and often there'd be an all ages show in the afternoon and then a bar show in the evening. Um, so I think I started going to them when I was like 12 and there was oh my God. Scenes, <laughs> scenes and tapes and I learned a lot of stuff. Um, there but also it was like when I first started going I think there was like two women in any of the like 20 bands that would regularly be playing for the most part it was all cis guys Um, and I think that's changed a lot recently 
but I wonder if this is a good time to do my little reading because it's from that. <laughs> I know <laughs> I was from that era. I I was just going to suggest it, Eva. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Eva, would you like to do your, your reading? Sure. Thank okay. you. Okay. So this is sort of from the, the middle of the book a little bit, and it's a flashback. In junior high, I used to go to all ages shows in the church hall by my house. At one of the shows, the singer of a band called Sewer Standoff got duct taped to a chair. The bassist walked in circles around the singer, wrapping tape around his torso in the back of the chair. Then the bassist dragged the chair across the room and set the singer in front of the drum kit. The wiener who'd organized the show was yelling about scratching the waxed hardwood floor. The bassist knelt and wrapped tape around each of the singer's calves, strapping them to the front legs of the chair. The singer could still bend his elbows. He held the mic up to his right shoulder and craned his neck to scream into it for two songs. At the start of the third song, he kind of jerked around for effect and knocked the chair over. The band kept playing, and some older guys in the front righted the chair. Three of them lifted the chair up over their heads. The crowd pulled away like a tide going out. But then someone passed the mic up to the singer, and he started screaming along with the music, and the crowd rushed back in. The older guys bounced the chair in the air, lurching the singer back and forth, and the crowd yelled along. I was standing next to Candace Walsh, and we were both shouting the words. When the mosh pit threw us together, her big boobs would smoosh against my arm, and we'd smile at each other like, what can you do? Then the chair came careening down. Somehow there was time for everyone to move out of the way. At first, the band didn't notice that the singer had fallen. For a moment, he was on the floor with the music rumbling over him, the crowd gone still around him. When the band stopped, first the drums, then the bass and guitar, one of the older guys held up a hand and told everyone to back the fuck up and then get the fuck out. In the parking lot, people were saying they saw blood. Someone said he'd stopped breathing. It wasn't dark yet. The sun was sinking on one side of the horizon, and a pale moon was visible in the sky across from it. It was one of those strange times when you can see dark pits in the moon's face even though the sky is still bright. Someone said the cops were coming and people came, sorry, people ran to stash beers behind the dumpster on the far side of the building. There was a narrow driveway leading up to the church hall and the ambulance got stuck behind a stream of parents' vehicles. The siren wow, wow, wowed as clumps of kids piled into the back seat and their parents' cars made tight U-turns to head back down the hill. I stayed and watched the paramedics carry the singer out on a stretcher. He was alive, but there was blood all over his face. One of his bandmates walked alongside the stretcher going, oh my God, man, I'm so sorry. So, so sorry, dude. The paramedics were stone-faced. That's it. <laughs> beautiful. Um, you know, Eva, I don't know if it was the same punk show, but I can remember because this community uh, center was across the street and on a hill across from where we lived. And I remember you going off and you couldn't have been Maybe you were 14. I, I dread to think you were 12, but I remember many, many, many it seemed uh, police cars and uh, ambulances surrounding them, the lights going and kids pouring out and I could see it from my bedroom window. So, so um, thank you for that memory. <laughs> I think there was some broken bones and teeth, but it was pretty, turned out okay in the end. Good, glad to, glad to hear it. Um, so you you've spent a lot of time around the bay as a, as, as a young child because we come out here in the summers and we're we're in a place next to a beautiful river and there's a big lake to swim in and we're across the street from the ocean. I don't know if that really makes it into your novel, does it? There is one small scene um, around the bay, but I've been writing about that a lot recently. Um, I just finished a paper at, <laughs> that was due at 9 a.m. this morning, my last one of the semester. Um, so it's a, it's a nonfiction piece about 
my aunt Wanda actually inspired by this wall hanging here that she gave to me. I don't know if people are able to see it. Um, but so it's about that work of art and uh, going out there with her as a, as a really little kid. And um, she's a lesbian as are a lot of her friends and they've moved out to Broad Cove and have a kind of informal queer community there and just about how beautiful it was to get to spend time there with them when I was really young and the big parties that they would have and how they kind of integrated over time into the local community and how the locals join them at the parties now as well and their all day affairs with dogs and children playing on the swing set she built and then traditional Newfoundland music in the evening um and yeah just how how lucky I feel to have got to have experienced and grown up with that in my life and what about the landscape does the landscape uh enter into your writing at all or um I have been thinking about that a lot lately again in terms of nonfiction that I'm writing um this is my thesis is about visual art from Newfoundland so I've been writing about Will Gill's work and he had this sculpture um that was a steel chair that's made to look like a kind of traditional wooden chair that you would find in a Newfoundland kitchen anchored to this outcropping of rock in the ocean near Bonavista it was there for months until it was just destroyed by the ocean. Um, and the piece is kind of about the power of nature um, and the landscape in Newfoundland. So I've been writing a piece that's about Will's piece, but also about on New Year's Day, my friends and I got in the ocean um, <laughs> and had like this wild physical experience of the adrenaline and just I feel like glee <laughs> afterwards that was just kind of like the coming from the body being like you're alive still <laughs> in spite of what you just did well your your writing is really visceral Eva you know like it really is about the body in so many ways and 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 sensuality and you know uh, so I'm not surprised to find out that you're jumping in the ocean in, in on New Year's Day, um, just to see what it feels like. Mm -hmm. um, so this novel is, is about queer love and queer sex. And uh, <laughs> well, it is, <laughs> okay. most assuredly is. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's about a lot of things, of course, but that is, it's a romance. There's a romance here. And I'm wondering, like, if there are, are queer writers uh, that, that influence you, or in Newfoundland, or artists, visual artists, or, yeah, or musicians, or? Hmm. Um, well, writers in Newfoundland, there's Daisy Jeffries is an incredible poet. Um, she writes about being trans and being in a from a very small place in rural Newfoundland, much smaller than where I'm from. Um, and she writes beautifully about that. Um, and other authors that I've been reading recently and really loved are uh, Joshua Whitehead, Johnny Appleseed, I'm sure many people have read this book, but it's really great. It's so much fun and also very moving. Um, I love Carmen Maria Machado, her short story collection. Um, her short story collection and her memoir are very different, but both like so skillful and just shows this incredible range. Um, so she's amazing. Um, also, uh, Butter Honey Bread Pig. This is an incredible book. Um, with it's about two twin sisters, and there's magic realism, and also these very beautiful descriptions of cooking that are threaded throughout. And I'm not at all a cook, but I was like so. The descriptions are so visceral of uh, cooking and eating, and and very sensual. And, and also lots of queer sex in here, if you're looking for that. Yeah. Okay. And um, 
one of the things that I, I wanted to ask you about your novel is about dialogue because you just have a way of it's pitch perfect it, it, as the cliche goes you know like you can you can really it leaps off the page you can hear it and i'm thinking myself about robert chafe who i know uh has whose book uh two man tent you you love and i love and but i know that you you've done a playwriting course with him so i imagine he's a influence yeah the story that all i ask is um I want to, I want to, going to say the story it's based on, but it's based on a play that I wrote in Robert Chafe's course, um, which was a, a great course. And I met a lot of people who really inspired me and I learned a lot from. Um, so I think that there is a lot of dialogue in this book because it was a play <laughs> originally. Um, but I enjoy writing dialogue um, and I think it's really fun to think about how people really speak, you know, like often they don't speak in full sentences and they don't say what they really mean or they accidentally reveal too much, um, trying to capture that and trying to capture all the ambiguity um, of the kind of tension between what people are trying to say and what they're really saying. Mm -hmm. You know, going back to Will Gill's chair, which I really recommend if you, uh, if anyone Googles after the interview, <laughs> if anyone Googles Will Gill's, do you know what the piece is called, Eva? It's called The Green Chair. Yeah, I mean, there are magnificent photographs of this chair uh, covered in ice. And, and I know that Will has said he was, maybe I read this in your piece, Eva, uh, that he was kind of emotionally you know, disrought when the chair was actually destroyed by the ocean. And I think the chair, it's a very powerful piece of art because a chair is designed for the single human body. And I think when you see that, you, you imagine a, a, a human scaled uh, person <laughs> um, up against that ocean when you look at the chair. And I feel like there is a comment about climate crisis in that piece. You know, how foolish we have been to imagine we could control nature. And there's a real thread of social justice going through your book, I think. You know, there, there is a, um, you, you talk about the police, but you also talk about Muskrat Falls and the, uh, dangers. So that's a huge hydroelectric uh, project in, in Newfoundland. Do you want to talk about, about, about that and about what it means to go to protests and be physically present at a, at a protest and to call politicians out, you know, with the vo human voice gathered in a group of people? Because I think that's in the novel as well. Well, um, as I sort of already mentioned like I was trying to write about that particular moment in St. John's in 2017 and the indigenous led resistance to the Muskrat Falls Dam was so important. Um, it still is and, and resistance is ongoing um, as unfortunately is construction of the dam, right? And um, so that was kind of all consuming for any, everyone in Newfoundland and Labrador at that time, I think. Um, and I think it would be impossible to write about St. John's at that moment and not acknowledge that that was happening um, and, and continues to be impacting many, many people's lives. Mm -hmm. But what did it feel like to go to those protests or at least to write a character who was at those protests? Like it felt to me that these young people are working job after job and, and, and still like heading out to, to charity events where they're raising money for things and, and also like walking in the streets and chanting. I think one of the things that I tried to capture in the book as well is that, you know, in St. John's, where I think, you know, the, the protests were definitely indigenous led, but it, the majority of the crowd or a large portion of it was white. There was a kind of um, 
you know, there was a lot of anger, but there was also the power of coming together. Um, and there was some excitement about coming together in resistance. Whereas in Labrador, where many of the people were indigenous, the police were very violent in how they responded to those protesters. Um, and it was horrific to see that unfolding. And um, I think it was a very different experience. Mm -hmm. um, this, this novel is also about friendship between women. You know, the protagonist, Stacy has this friendship with Viv, who it's a very, it's a very particular kind of friendship, the kind of friendship that forms between young women, I think, and, and they live together with um, Viv's boyfriend. And there's a just achingly tender scene where uh, Viv tells Stacy that her she and her boyfriend are going to get a house on their own and and move out. And it, you know, Stacy tries really hard to sound like it's okay. Um, and I know that you've spoken before about, um, yeah, what it means to live in with roommates and, and what kind of what that's like. I want to I want to know what you why you why you wrote about that. <laughs> I feel like my my roommates can maybe overhear me right now, <laughs> but um, so I hope they're not too annoyed. <laughs> um, but I think it's really, you know, a roommate relationship can be very intimate because you're spending so much time with people um, and you're telling them about your day and you're sharing labor. Um, and also Stacy and Viv are really good friends and they have established all these kind of systems of like, you know, how long the dishes can be left before you do them and where you put somebody else's mail and when it's okay to come into someone's bedroom and, and that kind of thing. And you figure out a way of living together. And um, I think that Stacy is, you know, understands that her, her friend wants to live with her partner. And, um, but it's also a kind of moment of reckoning for her where she's thinking about, you know, as a queer person, what is her future going to look like? And what is a family going to look like? Um, and, and living situations in the future. Yeah, so, so, you know, the roommate situation is sort of based on, uh, you know, well, it's about finances, it's about, you know, mm -hmm. sharing space and, and um, so, cutting cutting the rent in three ways or four ways or whatever the case may be. But it is also a kind of um, family that is, um, you know, not the nuclear family, right? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a different kind of, and I think your book really captures that. Um, Thank you. This is a, I just, because we're talking about books, I just want to show this book, which is called uh, Future Possible. And um, this is a, Eva has a, a piece in this book. Um, as does mom. <laughs> <laughs> as does mom. Um, and Eva's, so it's a collection. Of, it's a fantastic book. I mean, it has, um, it's, how would you describe it, Eva? Um, well, it's, it's a collection of essays about the art history of Newfoundland, which I think, has never really been collected in this way before. Um, and there's also just incredible like photographs of artwork. So it's a really beautiful physical object um, as well as, as you know, uh, interesting writing hope. You know, I, I liked a lot of the essays that were not mine. <laughs> You're just being, you're just being modest. You don't want to say it has great essays because you wrote one, but it actually That's does what I'm have trying a, to <laughs> a lot of great essays that need, you know, outside of what both we wrote. Yes. Um, we can celebrate the book without celebrating ourselves necessarily. Um, Mireille Egan uh, put this book together. She is the uh, editor and she's a curator at the Rooms, which is the Provincial Art Gallery. And the, the, mix of of essays is just incredible but the you're right the images are are beautiful but you wrote about 
Um, do you want to talk about one of the artists that you wrote about that, you know, I think is, is also an in influence on you? Mm -hmm. um, so I wrote about a few different artists in that uh, essay, but I guess I'll just talk about Peppa today, who happens to be one of my former roommates as well, Peppa Chan. Um, this is one of her works. So uh, it's called Grass in the Sky. And uh, this was in Bonavista. It's in an abandoned house. And the in whole inside of the house is full of sculptural work. Um, and she collaborated with uh, Mimi Stockland and Kaylee Bryant on this work. And it's about um, abandonment, kind of both on a personal level and a political level. So it's about like sentiments of childhood abandonment, but it's also about the way that rural Newfoundland has been kind of um, abandoned in some ways in terms of services um, and support from the government um, and how people have been kind of forced to migrate out of there. And uh, yeah, it's really cool work. Um do you want to talk a little bit about what you're doing with your PhD? Why does a writer who's like going great guns start a PhD? Um, I, well, I wanted to read more theory and I find it hard to read it on my own, to be honest. It's, it's really helpful to be able to talk through it with other people. Um, and I wanted to write about visual art from Newfoundland and I had been doing that for a while and interviewing artists and um, trying to understand from them like the ideas that they were exploring and the kind of vocabulary that they used to talk about it. But I had no formal training in art history. So I've just started learning about that um, this year and it's so exciting. Um, I'm really enjoying it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, I was telling uh, uh, Daphna and Alana and Emma and Harold before we came on that, um, you know, you, you were home in Newfoundland for the summer and we would go back and forth to Carbonier and you would be, you read to me from Suvankam Fama uh book, How to Pronounce Knife. And the stories were just, you know, so this is the winner of the Giller Prize, uh, the most recent Giller Prize. And the stories were so kind of miraculous, really. And, you know, I remember the first one that you read me and then when, and, and when you finished, I said, they can't all be that good. And you said, yes, they really are all that good. Can you talk about why that book moved you so much? Because you, di you did really love it. You do love it. Mm -hmm. It's such a beautiful book and all the stories are so like gracefully written I think there's so much in in such a short space and the sentences are very economical um and I think that they're like deeply moving without being you know sentimental and yeah it's a very powerful and beautifully written book yeah the prose is just really clear and transparent and crisp and just like deeply emotionally powerful. I mean, she won the Giller. We don't have to convince people. But it's also, it, oh, sorry. Go um, ahead. It's also- well, it's a very political book too. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I just, it's a very important memory for me of the summer that we we got to share that in the car going back and forth to, to Carbonera. It's very, uh, it's a beautiful thing to be read to. Oh. By your well, daughter. <laughs> I'm very grateful for that memory too, and for all the time that you spent reading to me. So that's mm -hmm. nice, Eva. Um, I'm I'm just going to remind people that they can ask uh, questions and put them in the chat. Um, uh, when uh, uh, when we're and I'll turn to them very soon. But I'm just going to ask you one last question, Eva. Uh, before we do turn to the questions in the chat. Um, you have a creative writing group 
and you also teach creative writing uh, through a community center in uh, Montreal. I want to ask you about uh, what what you get out of teaching, um, what it what it does for you. But I also want to ask you about your creative writing group and how that works. Um, so we meet about once a week um, on Zoom, and we each read work and offer feedback. And it's really helpful to have um, to have feedback and to also have people who are invested in your work and you know <laughs> a deadline of that as well. Um, Carmela Gray Cosgrove, who is a a good friend of mine and also a writer whom I really love uh, is in the group and she has a book coming out in the fall, I believe, um, called Nowadays and Lonelier, which I've got to have a sneak preview of in the, <laughs> um, in the writing group. So I would definitely recommend checking that out. Um, and yeah, I teach workshops through this organization called Surplus in Montreal that started doing online workshops at the beginning of the pandemic. And it's been so amazing because I've met people from all over the country. And it's a similar kind of thing. We meet um, in small groups once a week and everybody offers critique. And I give like a very short lecture on creative writing, different elements. It's called Fundamentals of Short Fiction. <laughs> so we just explore a different fundamental each week. But it's been like very inspiring for me and also just so nice to get to meet new people who are passionate about writing like in this moment in the pandemic um, when it's so hard to meet new people. So it's been really fun. And actually there's one starting next week that has lots of spaces left. <laughs> if anybody wants to sign up. <laughs> okay. All right, well, maybe we should turn to uh, some questions if we have any. Let's see. Um, Shar Kroshnik says, Eva, where do you find time to write while you are working on a PhD? That is a good question. Mm. It is a tricky balance. I just started in September, so I'm, I'm still learning how to do that. <laughs> Um, but I like to write early in the morning, so I've been trying to get up a little earlier <laughs> to do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sherry Parkin asks, I'm interested in your take on the meaning of the title, All I Ask. How did you come up with it? And please share the significance of it. Sure. So it's from a Lucinda Williams song called Metal Firecracker. Um, and Stacy and her girlfriend love Lucinda Williams and they listen to that song together. So it's partly a reference to that, but th the chorus of the song is, um, don't tell anybody the secrets I've told you. So this book is also partly about privacy um, and what you choose to share with other people and um, how violating it can feel to be forced to share things that you don't want to with people or institutions even more disturbingly. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, a reference to that as well. So, and you're, you're discussing the, um, the inciting incident of the novel there where um, the police burst into Stacy's home and uh, accuse her of um, some kind of digital crime she's not told what and they take her uh her technology her phone and her um her phone and her computer and and the police have access to all of that and so mm -hmm. it, it it's about uh it's about the notion of what privacy is and do you want to talk a little bit about that sure so yeah, so that inciting incident um, was based on an experience that I had that I think would have been far more horrific for me if I weren't a white cis woman, um, if I had had children there with me, if I had, say, a health condition, um, because it is very terrifying to have a group of armed men storm into your home. Um, so the book is kind of a begins with that 
incident. Um, and then it's a, a kind of fictionalized account of the aftermath of it. Um, yeah. Um, there's a question from a Lynn Moore. <laughs> My aunt. <laughs> Now you're just assuming it's your end. <laughs> um, she says, when you start a novel, do you figure out the plot first or the characters wondering how you'd get going? And that is, I'm trying to convince my sister to write a novel. So you should answer this one, Eva. <laughs> uh, well, I've just written the one so far, although I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to write another one. So in this case, I because I knew I wanted to write about that incident that happened to me I was thinking about the plot a lot from the beginning and um how to kind of tell that story in a way that didn't feel salacious um and also I knew I wanted to begin with that incident but I wasn't going to be writing a crime story or a mystery novel so I was thinking a lot about how to approach that and then also how to approach endings because I feel like, you know, in rare life, in real life, we rarely get um, a satisfying ending. And especially when you're dealing with the police. So I, I knew that I wanted to convey that through the structure of the book as well. But I think there's something too about the ending of this book. Uh, can I talk about the ending or is that a spoiler? I think it's fine. <laughs> so, you know, in the ending of this book, the roommates realize that there's been a gas leak in their house and they have to evacuate the house instantly um, and, and could have died from this gas leak. Um, it's another sort of environmental story in a way. Um, <clears throat> and to me, that ending really sums up beautifully the precarity of uh, this, these millennials, for lack of a better word, that particular generation of people who are inheriting here, at least in Newfoundland, uh, you know, a failed economy, a lack of jobs, um, you know, a, a disaster uh, in a certain way. Um, but it also captures the notion of, like, they are freed, they run out into the street. And, um, yeah, I, but it's open ended. And I'm wondering, yeah, just if you could talk a little bit more about things being open ended at the ending and, mm -hmm. and, and closure, I guess, and what closure means politically. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, I'm thinking about two things I've been reading about um, in school. One is the climate crisis. And the fact that many theorists are kind of saying like the end of the world is coming and we sort of have to decide how to gracefully approach that. Um, and the way to do it is to recognize that there are individual, there are real people who are suffering right now. Um, we can't give into the nihilism of the world's ending, so I'm giving up. We have to fight for the people who are most affected by the climate crisis. Um, even though there is this awful end that's coming, there's no saving us or tying us together. There's just mitigating uh, the suffering. And then the other thing that I was thinking about is that I've also been reading a lot about um, HIV and AIDS and the idea of memorialization and how there's kind of um, a push right now to, or there's, there's all this media coming out about sort of uh, AIDS in North America in the 80s. And it feels like a kind of memorialization of that time. But the truth is that the AIDS crisis is ongoing here and in other places in the world. And the, the memorialization of it is a way of saying, that it's over. We don't have to worry about this anymore. Um, and uh, I saw a really interesting artist, Sean Kelly, who talks about living with AIDS and makes work about living with AIDS. Um, and he made this great point that uh, in Quebec, they are announcing a Memorial Day for everyone who's died of COVID. And he was saying, you know, it's very important to remember those people and their lives. 
but also it frightens him because it feels like uh, too quickly putting a lid on things and saying that they're over um, when in fact it's, it's very much ongoing. And if we just continue to open up the economy and not, you know, give paid sick days, not take care of workers and allow, you know, focus on public health as opposed to the economy, then we're going to lose a lot more lives. Um, so those are just some thoughts about endings. Yeah, I don't know I mean, if that answers your question. No, at all. It, it, it does really. So your book kind of ends with a rupture and a rupture mm -hmm. is sort of, uh, you know, points to the instability of, of everything you've just talked about um, and, and how important it is to stay open to whatever, you know, to avoid close, closure if it's a false closure, mm -hmm. which it often is. Mm -hmm. um, there's a comment here from Miriam Trump. Just a comment, she says, what a gift it is for both of you to have your mom interview you. Well, it is a gift for me. <laughs> I, I have to say it's a real thrill and I'm really grateful to the Giller people. Um, and also she wants to know, how does one sign up for your writer's group, Eva? Uh, let me, I can share a link, I think, to, I'll share a link to all the workshops at Surplus because they have lots of cool stuff going on there in many different mediums. Um, I think I can post this, maybe, answer live. No. Okay, sorry, everyone. <laughs> well, then you can, oh, Emma says you can post here. Okay. In Thanks, the chat. Abba. <laughs> um, so uh, Nancy and Druzek says uh, the idea of the police investigation in the book based on a personal experience or an experience of a close friend and, and you said that it did happen to you mm -hmm. most, most horrifically. Uh, and uh, Janice McKay uh, says just a comment, not really a question. Recently, I have found myself drawn to flawed and sometimes unlikable characters. I may not have been able to relate to some characters, but I loved how you were able to help me understand the intentions behind their behaviors. I think that's a sign of great writing. Wow, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate that. You know, uh, Janice, that's a really interesting comment. I, I teach creative writing too, and I have this, sometimes the, my students in one class my students would always say oh I really like that story because the characters are relatable and I was constantly saying you know they don't we don't have to relate to them we have to be able to to get into the skin and the shoes of people that we don't necessarily understand or we don't always have to relate to them and and Finally, but they kept saying they liked the characters because they were relatable. And finally, I just blew up and said, relatable, relatable. I don't want relatable. And then they formed a writing group called the Relatables. <laughs> Very <laughs> so, funny. Yeah. Um, but yes, it's true. Uh, you know, I think of um, The Apprenticeship of Duddy Kravitz, which by Mordecai Richler, uh, which is a hilarious book. Of a com about a completely despicable guy, and you know, or or uh, you know, and he, he of course, Study Kravitz is despicable in a funny way. Uh, it's a hilarious book, but if we think about Lolita by Nabokov, you know, there is a, a horrendously uh, dislikable, you know, horrific character in Humbert Humbert, and we read to to understand there as well, I think. Um, I just read this book called Daryl by Jackie S. And uh, it's about, the whole book is about this guy who's a cuckold. He's somebody who likes for other men to have sex with his wife. And this is what the whole book is about. And initially, I think I thought of him as a very unlikable character. But he's very, it's, it's really hard to tell if he's like very earnest or taking the piss the entire time. And I think that's a fascinating dynamic too when you're trying to pin down whether you are supposed to relate to a character or not. Um, and whether the author wants you to or not. Um, 
what the kind of narrator's relationship to the reader is, if they're, you know, genuinely wanting to connect with the reader or if they're making fun of you, maybe, <laughs> which is very that's, different than my own writing. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. There's another question from Jennifer McKenzie, who says she's from Guelph, Ontario. I'm enjoying this conversation. I've Apparently, I didn't read deeply because it was a delightful surprise to find the mother-daughter connection. More Newfoundland geography, please. I actually have my map from Newfoundland tourism beside me. <laughs> That's great. Well, we're, we're, uh, we're on the Avalon Peninsula, which is quite often uh, socked in fog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but not today. It was beautifully sunny. And Eva, I think we have uh, just one more question. So this is from Bonnie Proven from Victoria, who would like to know if you started writing at a young age. Actually, I would like to hear the answer to this question too. Yeah, I remember, um, well, my, you know, mom certainly encouraged that and my dad um, and my mom would help me keep a journal. I actually have dyslexia, so I had a lot of trouble learning to read and write. Um, and I remember like walking around pretending to read books <laughs> and making up the story because it took me a long time to learn to read. Um, but I, I think I was always making up stories. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, yeah. if I may, for a long time, Eva wrote stories when she was very young and always the mother died. And then one day, <laughs> I was like, what's with all these dying mothers? And then one day she wrote a story where a mother was alive, but in a coffin in the bottom of a ship. <laughs> well, I think I loved A Little Princess and also Muppet Treasure Island. So I think that's what the influence was. It wasn't anything to do with you. <laughs> I can yes. assure you. <laughs> no, I know. But I think there is, uh, you know, like in uh, young adult literature or children's literature, in order for the children to be free, they do have, they are often orphans, like, like um, uh, Anne of Green Gables or uh, even, um, oh, what's her name who puts the horse on the, on the, on the door and lifts it her father is a sailor and, and has gone off to sea all the time and she's left alone she washes the floor by attaching scrub brushes to her feet and oh Pippi long stocking thank you yes <laughs> so you know it, there, you were part of a long tradition eva <laughs> okay i want to say a big thank you to everybody who who listened and came and reads books and um and, and asked questions. And also, Eva, I really want to thank you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I very much appreciate it. And thank you to everybody uh, who listened and helped make this happen. Okay, we'll and say good night. And while we're thanking everybody, I want to thank you, Lisa and Eva. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Mm -hmm. I hope you enjoyed hearing this mother-daughter interview. And you know what? It was It was great because you wouldn't really know that they were mother and daughter. Anyway, if you or any of your friends miss this, this interview will be available on our YouTube channel over the next couple of days. And please make sure that you join us on uh, May 10th to hear writer Tom Rackman interview David Bergen, whose novel, Hear the Dark, was shortlisted last year. And if you have subscribed to our book club mailing list you will be sent a registration note and if not please visit our website for more registration information thank you and good night <laughs>